And I will be reading from the English Standard Version. And it reads, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. God's word for his people. You may be seen. Bless the name of our Lord. We are grateful. <laughs> Glory to God Almighty. Come on. I know that when you come to the house, you say, how many times do we have to clap? How many times do we have to praise? If you can only think about what God has done and brought you through and brought you to, nobody has to even say it to you that you ought to be praising God. I know it seems like a little bit of a formality. you like, every time we come to the house, somebody said, keep praising them. Well, it already be birthed on the inside of you. Everything that have breath, all to praise the Lord. Tonight, I'm just so excited. I'm just so ignited and grateful that we can come to this house again and to be revived. My purpose tonight is to welcome you. If you've been here on Monday, you should have been welcome because Elder Cohen talked about change. And so if you came back on last night, Elder Cohen talked about restoration. And so as you come in tonight, we're going to wait and let God feed us what is already birthed inside of her. So tonight, you are welcome, truly welcome to hear the word of God, to receive it, and to again give him glory, honor, and praise. We want to say thank you to all of you that are here. There are ministers that continue to have joined us each night. See you, Beverly, Minister Beverly Medley. God bless you. If there are any other ministers that are visiting, I want to acknowledge you. But to the First Baptist Church family, myself, Pastor Everett, and Leading Lady Everett, we are so grateful. And to our executive ministry, thank you for pressing. We know that there has been challenges in our own ministry, but again, God is still faithful. And God is still healing. Does anybody know that God is still faithful and he still heals? I mean, what a move of God this week. And on last night, I cannot tell you, it moved me to tears to hear this woman of God minister out of the depths of her life. And being transparent. And again, I just want to say to you, Elder Cohen, God bless you real good. I say real good, and I know that he will. He is a God that will never fail. And his promises, oh, amen, I believe it. And certainly to you, Elder Elliot, God bless you. We thank God for your presence. It's always right by your wife's side. What an example. And I love you, brother, and I thank God for you. And to Minister Smalls, you just set me up last night looking at me like, what did I do? And you come up in here and melodiously lift this atmosphere and song. So I'm sure you're going to do it again tonight. If God has done it again, I know you can do it again. So to all of you, I want to get out of the way and just tell you you're welcome. And I thank you again. Our dear sister, I didn't get your name last night, but I want to acknowledge you and tell you, Tasha, well, God, Lavasha, God bless you. La, love, laughter, Lavasha. <laughs> uh, but God bless you. Uh, if you were not here last night, we just want to say that in order for you to sit here tonight and to see this woman of God and her husband and those that are here, she mentioned that an angel shifted their car. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we can take it for granted that you went through your entire day and you got here and you don't have a reason to thank the Lord. But she was praying while she got in the sanctuary. So I'm encouraging you tonight, get so free that whatever happened in the pages of yesterday, you're walking in a new day. So that's where you realize that even before the word goes forward, God has already spoken into our future. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, I do want to honor and say we want to give um, praise and thanks to all of you that are here, to Almighty God. But again, let's continue to be prayerful for uh, Sheriff Landrick Reed, who passed away, transitioned today. And again, his wife and family has already been mentioned in our intercessory, but we must be praying for this family. And so I say to you, I know it's really a heartbreaking uh, moment for many of us. Even Elder Cohen said it last night. There will be some death that's going to be unexpected. And here we're standing here tonight. Nobody would have known that. So already prophecy has been spoken. And so I want you to really grab hold of these truths. So at this moment while you're standing, I'm going to ask you to prepare for giving. And I'm going to be brief in allowing you to just allow the deacons to, to, again, instead of deacons, you come stand here. And I'm going to ask you to, on my left to make your way out to the right. And then on my right, make your way out to the left. We're going to do this expeditiously after I'm finished here. Minister Small is going to minister in song. And we're getting to the word of God. Amen. Again, as you all are standing and preparing your gift, we want to bless it and say thank you to God. But again, it's one thing to know that you may be on your last night of revival, but you're really on your first. <laughs> y'all, y'all going to catch that one tomorrow. <laughs> All right, let let us stand. God, we are thankful. And God, as you have blessed us today in so many ways, the gift of lying down last night and the power of the Holy Spirit that woke us up this morning, we say thank you. But God, just in case someone didn't really think about it, thank you for those guarding angels. Oh, God, how they keep us and protect us. And so tonight we say thank you and for the giver and for the seed. Each heart that's here tonight, as they give, bless them bountifully. Bless them, God, because they're giving out of the abundance of what you've given to them. Bless it, God, and multiply it and let it be used for the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, if you will, if Ron, I don't know where you are, but if you will, let's just have deacons, you'll stand here. They're going to come meet you. Deacon Daniels, hold tight. Deacon Daniels, Deacon Daniels, stay right there. They're coming to you. <laughs> come on, come on, from the back. Come on up. Let's move. I want to make sure we get to this word in a timely matter. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, Minister Small, give her a microphone. So at this time, once again, we're thankful. Um, I, w- I don't want to go through any more of, of, of pulling time away from God's servant tonight. But after the selection from Minister Small, uh, the voice that you shall hear is God's daughter. If this is your first night here, um, I want you to know that she not only loves God, she also talks to God just like we talk to family. She keeps it real, authentic. But in order for you to receive her tonight, you have to get self out of the way. And I said to her last night, she spends those first few moments digging in the dirt, drowning us, molding us bringing us to the moment of hearing the preach word. So to Elder Gwen Cohen, thank you for saying yes. The word is fitting for the house. Thank you for the change. And thank you for the restoration. Did y'all who were here last night say, I got my voice back. Got my life back. 
got my dreams back and got my legacy back. So that tells all of us, grandmothers, grandfather, all who have some encounter with the people of God, he's given you assignment. So live it and operate in the power and the authority. After the voice of Minister Small, the song, you shall hear our very great woman of God, God's daughter, Elder Gwen Hester Cohen from Faith Harvest out of Shelby, North Carolina. Hallelujah. Is that word hallelujah? I'm just practicing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Do you mind if we just give God a good shout of praise? For he is so worthy. He is so worthy. He brought you over a mighty long way. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. Bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. Oh God. Body greater than you. Hey, I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody, nobody greater, come on, nobody greater, nobody greater than you, come on, sing it, sing it out loud and say, you searched all over, searched all over, couldn't find, searched them, yeah, Nobody, nobody greater, nobody greater. Oh, one more time, I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Still, nobody. of your hands oh mighty are the works of your hands oh your name is above our name you're worthy you're worthy of all our praise come on and say mighty are the works of your hands I say and low still couldn't find nobody 
nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Come on and give God some praise. Come on, give God glory in this place. I'm going to ask you to give God glory in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, we're practicing. Is that how you're going to sound in heaven? Hallelujah. Is that how you're going to sound in heaven? When you finally have made it in, after all you've been through, come on, give God glory in this house. Come on, give God glory in this house. Hallelujah. I'm a little hoarse, but I, hey, I'm still going to give him glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on. Is he worthy? You know you didn't get here on your own, right? You know you can't inhale and exhale on your own, right? Come on, give him glory. I'm going to stay in this moment. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can't rush our praise. We can't rush our praise. There's something that you're looking for. There's something that you're asking for, but it's in your praise. Hallelujah. I can't do it to know that he did. If you were here last night and God restored your life, I need to know that he did. Did he restore your life? Did he restore your dreams? Anybody dream last night? Hallelujah. Dreams that you thought were over. Dreams that you thought were dead. Dreams that you thought you'd never dream again. Hallelujah. And did he restore your legacy? Come on, somebody. I know the kids are acting crazy, but it's all right. He has the ability to restore. Hallelujah. 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 Y'all know I'm just practicing. Hallelujah. 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 Bless your name, God. I thank you and I worship you. There are no words in the English language for you. You are Adonai, my Lord, my Lord. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Rapha, my healer. You are Jehovah Shalom, my peace. You are Jehovah Tiskadu, my righteousness. Oh God, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. That you know my name. You know my name. You know my name. Hallelujah. 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 You know my name. And every tear. Hallelujah. Every tear. Y'all pardon me. If y'all ain't gonna worship, I am. Hallelujah. Every tear. Every tear. Anybody cried here? Anybody cried anytime? No, I mean in the late midnight hour. All the and you wanted to wail, but you couldn't wake anybody up. You were afraid if you started wailing in the house, you'd wake everybody up. God knows. Hallelujah. He knows. Come on, put your hands together. Bless the name of the Lord. Come on, keep going, keep going. It's funny that I would, I would uh, last night talk about restoring your voice. <laughs> And then wake up this morning and not have a voice. But we're going we gonna to have a voice anyway. Hallelujah. 
we're going to have a voice anyway. God is going to restore all of us, and I'm going to get through this word, hallelujah, in Jesus' name, right? Ah, First Baptist, Wadesboro. You guys are amazing. I need to let you know. I know you all think I've ministered to you, but you have certainly ministered to me at a time when I needed it. And I am so grateful to all of you. I don't count it robbery that you came out on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday. These are work days. They're work days for me. They're work days for you. But I so appreciate you coming out. Keep playing softly, please. I so appreciate you coming out and hearing the word of the Lord through me. It means a lot. It means a lot. We had folk Monday night who traveled a good ways to come. And I'm so grateful for them. And then Tuesday, I'm just, I'm, I'm just full right now. Because it means that you love your church. Amen. And you submit to the leadership of your pastors. And we say in leadership, if you cannot follow, you cannot lead. You made a decision to come out. Amen. I'm just going to ask if somebody can give me a little bit more on the mic and the monitors so I don't feel like I'm hollering too loud. Although we never know what the Lord's going to do. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And of course, I'd have to do this. I bring you greetings from Faith Harvest Church in Shelby, North Carolina. From Bishop Randy and Lady Norma Borders. Amen. And again, I'm grateful to you for coming. And of course, you know, I got to, you know, y'all know I got to holler out my boo. All right, over there. <laughs> Elder Elliot Cohen. Come on, y'all put your hands together for the man of God. And in case you're wondering, he is the head of my house. He is the head of my house. He is the priest over my life. He prays for me. He is the head of my house. He is the priest over my life. He prays for me. He talks to me. He fusses at me. Because I am, uh, have a pathology of being an overachiever. And there are moments where he has to remind me that anything and everything that I do, I do in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because um, sometimes I get real heady, don't I? And because I am an intellectual, and that's how God made me, I tend to move through intellect. And he has to often remind me, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And then, of course, to my traveling partners, Minister Lolita Small. Come on, y'all change together for the worship. <clears throat> Don't worry, he's coming back. And of course, too, we, like I said last night, you always got to have comic relief in the group. And we have an aspiring comedian. I want you all to remember the name, Navasha Hollis. She goes by V. You are going to be seeing her in some awesome places. Um, you'll find funny stuff going on in the church. Thank you, my brother. He said all the time. So I want y'all to pay attention. Because if you do something funny, you might hear it on Facebook. You might hear it on YouTube. You might look up and hear it on TV. And you'll say, is she talking about me? <laughs> but I'm grateful that she's here. Um, I don't want to disappoint. We're going to get right into the word of God. Um, oh, that's good. That work. Oh, that's great. Right there. That's good. That works. Um, our theme has been change, restoration, and transformation. Monday night, we talked about what? Change. And, and we asked the question, what will you do when he comes another way? We spoke to Matthew 8 and Matthew 14. That in Matthew 8, when the disciples were in the storm, Jesus was in the boat, asleep. In the boat, asleep. Same disciples, same boat, same storm, same Jesus. But when we got over to Matthew 14, and the same boat on the same sea, 
same storm, same disciples. Jesus came another way. He walked. And we came to the conclusion, if I'm correct, that we are challenged to change. There are some things in our life that while I like Jesus sleeping on the boat, we need him with us to walk on. Amen? And then last night, we embraced restoration. We talked about a man, a woman, a boy, and a, the man was a deaf mute. He could not speak. Restoring our life, the woman with the issue of blood. Restoring our dreams, Jairus' daughter, Jesus says, she ain't dead. She just sleep. And we know that when you're sleeping, it's when you're dreaming. And restoring our legacy, the man who brought his son to Jesus and the disciples who had seizures, who pitched himself in fire, threw himself in water, and how this man was watching his legacy be destroyed, watching his future be dismantled. He restored our legacy. He restored our generations. So tonight is our last night in revival. Somebody say revival. revival. Are we in a revival for real? Somebody say revival. revival. That's good. And we are looking at transformation. We got change. <laughs> we got restoration. And tonight we're looking at transformation. Here's what I want you to say. Change restores me. But restoration transforms me. Let's say it again. Change restores me. But restoration transforms me. So I have decided to change. We have decided to change. We have received the restoration of Jesus Christ in our voice, in our life, in our dreams, and in our legacies. And I want you to understand that you are standing here watching the enemy work. But he is unsuccessful. And we bind his hands on my vocal cords. And we loose the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I will be heard. The Holy Spirit will be heard. Jesus will be glorified. And the enemy will be horrified and terrified in the name of Jesus. And so now I am transformed, right? In other words, what I thought I couldn't do, I can do. What I considered I shouldn't do, I shall do. And what I didn't think I would do, I'm willing to do. And listen, I'm coming back to that. I'm all the way in on it. I've been changed. I've been restored. I'm 100%. I'm fully committed. I'm engaged. You can't stop. Close. Right. Sure you are. We define change as stepping into what's newer or better. And we talked about the resistance to change. It was very interesting to me because we're about the business of saving souls, but we don't want to change to do that. And restoration is to return to an original condition or to give something stolen, taking away a, or a loss back to the original owner. Well, if you've truly engaged change and you have embraced restoration, then transformation should be what we see because transformation means a dramatic alteration to your form and to your appearance so you can't tell me you saved and be mean to the saints you can't tell me you saved and walk in the church house and not speak to people you can't tell me you're saved and not forgive In other words, when we, when I decide to be newer or better, we are and returning to our original condition, it should dramatically alter how we look, how we sound, and how we act, and how we interact. I should know you know Jesus. 
I shouldn't have to ask you, are you saved? I shouldn't have to ask you, are you fire baptized, Holy Ghost? I shouldn't have to ask you those questions when I see you. And when I see how you interact with others, I should know a change has happened in your life. When I see how someone mistreats you and how you respond, I should know whether there's a change in your life. Second Corinthians 5.17, I've said it each night, haven't I? If any man be in Christ, what? He's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are new. You can't tell me if you say, this is how my family is. You can't tell me if you're saved. You know, I'm a butler. We always act like that. Not if you're changed and not if you're restored in process automatically I should see transformation we should see transformation people should see transformation go minister to her and her babies and call her name and tell me you saved or the boy on the corner with his pants down you mean to tell me you're gonna talk about him ride by instead of riff your hand and begin to pray while you're sitting in the car and begin to bind and loose. Yes, yeah, see, that's all. That's it. That's what Jesus did. He didn't hang out here. That's what made the Sadducees and the Pharisees so angry at God and teach and preach and then go out and, and go into the highways and byways and the homes of those that were called sinners. The people that you're talking about, I'm still talking about transformation. That's where you'd find Jesus. The prostitute you're talking about, you'd find him talking to her. Transformation. So we're shifting tonight from Matthew's gospel and we're moving into John's gospel. Y'all mighty quiet. Yeah, I understand. It's okay. Ouch. Chapter 5, John's Gospel, Chapter 5. More definitively, I'm going to verses 1 through 11. It's a story that many of us who have come in church know the man at the pool. It is a biblical story that's familiar to us, but tonight at the direction of the Holy Ghost, we are looking at several different perspectives. And I want to look at the statement Jesus made to the individual who's experiencing a transformation moment. So I want somebody to say transformation, transformation, the missing ingredient. Transformation, transformation, the missing ingredient. So I want to read it. I'm going to read. I've been in the message most of the week. I'm going to be at the New King James Version. I'm really starting at verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches in these lay a great multitude of sick people blind lame paralyzed waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain time somebody say a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had now a certain man, somebody say a certain man, 38 years. When long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Pay attention to this. The sick man, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. That's an oxymoron in that sentence. Because he says, and I have to go back to it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He is arresting me. I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, wait a minute. Is somebody helping for me? Jesus said to him, thank you, Holy Ghost. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. 
And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. First thing I want to talk about with transformation, the missing ingredient, I want to talk about the gate. Because I love settings. Jesus never goes anywhere without it having emphasis. He never just walked anywhere. If you pay attention to scripture when you're reading, you will find location, location, location. There's a reason Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up in a particular place, does a particular miracle with a particular person. And so today Jesus shows up at the sheep gate. I want you to understand something about this gate. This was the first gate Nehemiah restored when he rebuilt the wall. And the sheep gate, because it was the gate where they led the sheep to the market and then where the lambs were sold and washed for sacrifice. Come on, somebody. This gate, now, now, now hear this. This is where Jesus is. Come on. Jesus, we talking about Jesus, right? Y'all understand? Jesus has showed up at the sheep gate right there. This is the same gate. That leads, that leads to Golgotha. It's the same gate he has to walk through to go to Calvary. It's the same gate he has to step through for the crucifixion. The sheep gate represents step through for the crucifixion. The sheep gate represents the experience of salvation made available by the cross. Everything begins and ends at the sheep gate. I'm still talking about transformation. Jesus said, I am am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved no better place to show up than a place where people were seeking to be transformed y'all I'm getting happy see because I can see him walking through the sheep gate and I'm hearing him say, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me will never die. I can see him walking through the sheep. Come on, y'all looking at me like I, something wrong with me. The sheep gate. Here's where this place was. This pool is here at the sheep gate. The gate where salvation is. The place of sacrifice, the place where the lamb is slain at the sheep gate, here is Jesus. Now, I just remember looking at me like, yeah, I, like I'm talking, am I, am I in the right place? Am I in the how? Because you know, I like y'all talk back to me. Y'all sitting there looking at me like, what? Okay. He was the missing ingredient. Somebody say change restores me. Transformation. The other place I want to talk about is the pool. The pool of Bethesda. So we've talked about the sheep gate. We understand the significance of the sheep gate, right? Y'all tired? Y'all all right? Okay, all right. The pool is a structure that's intended for swimming and bathing. But this pool was no ordinary pool. Ordinary pool. Biblical archaeologists believe this pool was a hot spring of healing. Bethesda means house of mercy and loving kindness. Now, I understand in the psalm, the Lord said, David, no, David said, your loving kindness and your tender mercy endures for all generations. So I need y'all to understand well, who were here last night. We're talking about legacy. Your loving kindness and your tender mercy endures for all generations. Here comes Jesus 400 years after the Old Testament. Loving kindness and tender mercy stepping through a sheep gate knowing that he's going to be slain knowing he is the lamb ah knowing he is the lamb knowing he's going to be slain and here he comes loving kindness and tender mercy personified at a pool and there was something about the water it moved that's the text, y'all. Where, where, where that? Let me pull the text back up. That's the text. I want to make sure. It says, there was a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. 
waiting for the certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. After the stirring of the water, someone was made well of whatever disease he had. But first there was movement. Now movement, we know, just means something is moving from one, di uh, one direction into another. Am I correct? Is that what movement is? I'm stepping in one direction to the other. So the water is moving from one direction to the other. But movement does not necessarily matter. While they were looking at the movement of the water, they were also waiting for the stirring of the water. And the stirring of the water was what made the difference. You want change? You want restoration? You want transformation? Something ought to be stirring on the inside of you. You can move from one pew to another, brother. But something happens when the Holy Ghost stirs something on the inside of you. Out of your belly flows rivers of living water only when the stirring happens. Hmm. He was the missing ingredient. Somebody say, change restores me. Restoration transforms me. So we've talked about the gate, and we've talked about the pool, and we've talked about the water. Y'all with me? I'm going somewhere. I really, really am. Hang tough with me. I'm going somewhere. We're talking about transformation. Now I want to talk about the multitude. I got a question of this text. Pastor Everett, I want you to come with me. I want y'all to do something. Okay, no, I want you to stand right there, Elliot. Pastor Everett, I want you to go to the back of the room. Play for me, son. Come on, yeah, we can do something here. Okay. All right. Pastor Everett, Everett is Jesus, and you the man in the pool. Come on in, Pastor Everett. Come on in. And you're going to have a good, okay. Have a conversation. Have a conversation. Okay. That's a good conversation they're having. I want you to pay attention. Come on, y'all. Okay, y'all going a whole nother way. We need to have a play about that. Come on with it. Yes, son. Come on with it. Come on with it. Come on. Come on. So rise. Take up your bed and walk. Okay. And he walks with Jesus. Y'all walk out together. Oh, wasn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? They did that. I'm getting ready to mess you up. Here's what I don't understand. All y'all were watching what happened. That man had been here for 38 years. Y'all are the multitude. How come nobody hollered, I'm next? I'm talking about transformation. Wait a minute. When Jesus walked in, it's a whole lot of sick people laying around. First off, everybody going to look up to see somebody walking. They were blind. They were lame. They were paralyzed. Somebody could see them. And then he has a conversation with somebody they've seen for 38 years. And the person gets up, takes up their bed, and walks out. And nobody says, Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. What's your name? What's your name? I've been here. What's your name? Sit on that for a minute. Nobody, nobody in this multitude, they had to have seen the conversation. They saw a man who was laying there for 30, and this is what bothers me about this text. Blind Bartimaeus had enough sense to sit on the side of the road and holler, son of man, have mercy on me. And you blind, you lame, you at least the lame and paralyzed people ought to got healed. 
And then they could have told the blind people, I know you can't see it. I know you can't see it. But guess what? We're going to go to him because you'll be able to see it in a minute. I'm still talking about transformation. Because that's what we do in the church. We watch folk get transformed. We watch folk get healed. We watch folk get delivered. But it requires too much. We don't want to get up. We don't want to pick it up. And we don't want to walk. The multitude in this space is considered impotent. They were unable to produce. That's what that word means, unable to produce. There was nothing in them that they were able to produce. But what gets me is that John breaks it down into three different categories. Because not only were they unable to produce, they were blind. There were some of them that were blind, which meant they were unable to see. But that term blind, in the, they were conceited, they were haughty, multitude. And then there were lame folk. Now, this is very interesting because that word lame in the King James Version means halt. It means cripple, severely damaged, malfunctioning, but it also means deprived of feet. So what that tells me is that there were folk who were in the multitude who refused to walk out the promise that God had spoken over their life. They had made a decision that they were going to sit and they were going to stay and they wasn't going to move because my mama bought this pew. My granddaddy paid for the altar. My uncle paid for the pulpit. I'm not moving. I'm not doing anything. I'm not saying nothing. I don't care if they ask me to do anything. I'm sitting right here. You're lame. You're lame. You're lame. You're lame. So you have blind, conceited people. You have people that refuse to walk out the promise and plan of God. Then you have paralyzed folk. And paralyzed is related to everybody thinks, of course, we say paralyzed, somebody can't move. But in the study, there were refusal to do the very thing that would save them and their family. How dare we blame the pastors? How dare we blame the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers? How dare we blame the bishops and the elders for the fact that God is not flowing freely in our lives when in fact we are the problem because we made a decision that we can get what we need off the internet. I don't need to spend no time with God. I just need to listen to somebody on Facebook. I don't need to spend no time with God. There's a prophet I like on the internet. I don't need to spend no time with God. The multitude. My question for you tonight in this space of transformation, who are you? Are you part of the multitude? Here's something else I want you to understand. All right, that there was a multitude there, and you're engaging in transformation. If you make a decision to be transformed, don't expect the multitude to follow. Don't expect your family may not follow. Your friends may not follow. Your crew may not follow. Your best girlfriend may not follow. Your fraternity may not follow. Your sorrow may not follow. When you're really transformed, don't expect the multitude to follow. We ain't gonna have no fans. Stop looking for a Facebook following. False prophesying on the internet just so you can get people to follow what your transformation and worrying about your following. I'm going to keep moving. L, you might have to start the car. I know the efforts got my back. I know they do. Got my back. I know they got my back. But in case we got to run out. All right, I'm picking with you. Transformation, I want to talk about the conversation. Do you want to be made well? Now, in the King James Version, it says whole. I'm using the new King James Version. It says well. Do you, come on, say it with me. Do you want to be made well? Let's say it again. Do you 
want to be made well. Now, I grew up in old school, old school way when it came to English. And uh, my husband, I'll tell y'all, his mom was my English teacher. Ruth Cohen, third, fourth, and fifth grade. And I loved her because she said to me that I was different. And I didn't go out on the playground and play with everybody else, but she would give me books to read because I was a reader. I was a thinker. Had no idea I was going to marry her youngest son. But I do have a quick side-by story. I had a crush on him in the third grade. I did. We went to University Park Elementary School in Charlotte, North Carolina. My mother was a social worker at the school. So I had a crush on Elliot Cohen. And we were doing a play called A Mall and the Night Visitors because they were very much about the arts. I, that was before schools were integrated. Very much about the arts and us learning about the arts and speaking, public speaking, and learning about government. They did so many creative things for us to learn. The lessons that I remember even now. And at the backstage of a mall in the night visitors, I said to Elliot Cohen, I'm going to marry you. In the, I was in the third grade. He was in the fourth grade. Now I'm going to tell you what he said. He looked at me and was like, hmm, whatever, and walked off. He was fourth grade. And he told me one day, he said, I didn't say that. You didn't have to. I spoke it into the atmosphere 26 years later. 26 years later. But my point being is that I learned to diagram sentences. Anybody ever remember when they made you diagram a sentence? They laid the sentence out. You put the line over it. You put the bars and you said what was an adverb, what was an adjective, what, I mean, all a noun and a pronoun. That's how you learned the, the, the characteristics of a sentence. And that's how you learned to write sentences, that they had to have what? A noun, a verb, adjective, and adjective adverb they, and you even learn punctuation so I want us to take a moment we're gonna go old school I want to diagram this sentence stay with me son stay with me Jesus says do you want to be made well transformation this conversation y'all tired I'm not tired now I got my energy back I'm good I'm ready to run Y'all sitting there looking at me, it's all right. We gonna, I'm going to run in a minute. The first thing that he says is, do you? Which indicates that the listener is responsible for something. I'm talking about transformation. We're sitting around waiting for Jesus to transform us out of heaven, and he's asking the question, do you? Because it means you are responsible for how this is going to turn out. You are responsible for how this is going to end. You are responsible for how this blessing is going to go. You are responsible for whether or not you're going to create wealth. You are responsible for whether or not your children are going to be delivered. You are responsible for whether or not your church is going to be full. You are responsible for making sure you got money in your bank account. You are responsible. Do you? Do you? He starts out looking at the man and says, do you? Do you? And then he says, want. Want implies a desire to be different. What do you want? Do you want to be where you are right now? Do you like how you're living right now? He says, desire that nobody knows that you have said to God, this is what I want. He tells us he'll give us the desires of our heart. So he says, do you want? In other words, are you really interested? Are you really interested? Or are you just faking it? Or are you just standing around saying how God put a promise on my life? Yes, do you want? Do you want? I want to be an entrepreneur. And Jesus is saying, if you want it, have you written a business plan? Do you want, he says, do you want to be different? Do you want to be changed? We're back at change, change. And then he says to be. Do you want 
to be? Well, I learned that to be is a future statement. But it's not a far future statement. Glory to God. I'm preaching. I know I'm preaching. I know I'm preaching. Gwen, preach. Preach, Gwen, preach. Uh, it's not a far off. It's off. It's a near future. Get out your head. Just be. Well, I got to share this with you. I'm in the car. I done typed a whole bunch of notes. We get to the church, and I discover that all of my notes are gone. Everything that I typed, us coming down the road. Everything that I thought the Lord wanted me to deliver to, to you tonight. And guess what they said to me in the car? The same thing Prophet done in the near future, right now, and want to be. In the near future. The near future means tomorrow. The near future means tonight. The future means before the month is out. The near future means before the week is out. The near future means before the year is out. You can be it in 20. Look here. She said, don't do it. Be it. Jesus said, do you want to be And then he says, and I love what made means in this text because it don't mean what y'all think it means. It means come on the stage. <laughs> appear in history. Receive or become. He's saying to this man, do you, you're responsible for this. Do you desire to be different in the future? And something that will appear in history. When we read our Bible and the first story we go to in John chapter 5 is the man at the pool. And he's been here ever since the canon has been put together. I want to know tonight, do you want to be made? Do you have a mark in history? Do you have a future? Do you want to appear on the stage, the stage of life, decreeing and declaring the word of the Lord? Do you want to be made? Do you want to be made? Do you want to be made? Taste, do you want to be made? Ask somebody next to you. Neighbor, do you want to be made? Thing that happens. Do you want to loosen bind? Do you want to stand up and tell the Lord, I'm ready to come out of the multitude. I'm ready to come out of the multitude. I refuse to be blind. I refuse to be lame. I'm going to walk out my purpose step by step. I love that because when we put our clothes on, there are tags in the back. And they say what? Made in the USA. Made in China. Right? Made in India. And when you look at the tag, you can determine the quality. Oh, Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus. You can determine the quality of the garment. By the tag, I can tell the quality. Hallelujah. I want to know when I walk up to you and look at your tag, I need to know are you quality or have you got a cheap gospel? I want to know are you quality or have you got a cheap gospel? And I ought to be shoe paid the cost that came, the price that came. Did you deny yourself? Did you lay down your life so others could be saved? I should be. I need to be able to be tell how you were made by your tag. Quality? I don't know about you, back in my day, they used to look at hymns. <laughs> my folk go shopping. It, it was like you dressed up because they wanted you to know, they wanted the people in the store to know that they had the money, that they had the quality, and they had the wherewithal to know what they were buying. And they were there because they had the right to be there because they could pay for whatever they needed to pay for. So you didn't walk into the store any old kind of way. When you walked into the store, they looked at the clothes you had on and knew you had got them from Dillard's, from Nordstrom's, from Belk's, from John Wanamaker, from Lord and Taylor. They knew from Saks Fifth Avenue. They knew. So the clerk knew how to come up to you. 
based on your appearance. Good God. The clerk knew how to come up to you based on your appearance. Are you wondering why people aren't coming up to you? It might be because they see cheap and they're figuring out that can't help me. I need somebody that paid a cost by fasting and praying. I need a tag that says I can lay hands on you and you can be healed. I need a tag that says if you lift up my kids I, and the water will get activated. Well, he says, do you, come on, say that with me. Do you want to be made he's saying do you want to be restored do you want to be restored let me say this do you realize the condition that you're in is not the condition that God sees you in so now if he knows you're in from your beginning then why are you choosing to be a part of the multitude and stay blind lame and paralyzed paralyzed when in fact he to be made well because well means to increase and become greater. Anybody want to be made well? Anybody want to be made well? Anybody want increase? Increase, increase, increase. Anybody want greater? Hallelujah. Anybody want greater? Anybody want greater? That's what he says. He says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be restored? Wait a minute, and this is on you. <laughs> That's the part. This is on you. It ain't even on me. Listen to this now. Jesus is saying to him, this is Jesus asking him a question. Because he wants to know, do you really want what I have for you? Because some of us don't really want what he has for us. Imagine he hadn't walked for 38 years, which meant when he got up, he might have been a little bit unsteady. Okay, but he still was in a position that he'd never been in in 38 years. It never tells us how old he is. It never tells us how he got there. It never tells us who brought him there because to Jesus, what happened didn't matter. It was what was going on right now in that transformation moment. I don't care about your past. I don't care about what anybody committed adultery. Hallelujah. We're going to cut some umbilical cords. Cords to your past. Cords to the graveyard. Cords to the things that you've done. Cords of shame. Cords of guilt. We're going to cut them tonight in the name of Jesus. Your people is gone in Jesus' name. It has to dry up. It has to shrivel up. The blood is against you. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. We're walking in the sheep gate. We're making a decision to do what Jesus said. Hallelujah. 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 You know what I was? God said, I'll redeem the time. Jesus, glory. So the man gives a reason. He gives an excuse. And wherever else, because you want to look good at church and pay the light bill, you'll be all right. But that's a story for another day. And so, so he's blowing my mind. He doesn't speak to his flesh. But his flesh is the one that's tangled up. His flesh is a thing that ain't working. His flesh is the part that ain't doing what it's supposed to do. That's his flesh. But Jesus doesn't speak to his flesh. Jesus speaks to his spirit. Come on here. Jesus doesn't speak to his flesh. He doesn't say legs, straighten out. He doesn't say feet, straighten out. He doesn't say knees, straighten out. He doesn't do the hip bone, thigh bone. He doesn't do that. He does not do that. He says, rise. To his spirit. To his spirit. Because his flesh answered Jesus. But in his spirit, he, he wanted to be whole. So Jesus says, I, I can't talk to that because he can't talk to that. I can't talk to your flesh. I have to talk to your spirit. And I have to have your spirit rise up in you. 
Because if your spirit rises up, then the rest of you got to get up. Glory, glory, glory. When your spirit rises up, the rest of you has to get up. Now, I recognize there are infirmities and diseases out there, but I believe, I believe, and I told y'all last night, I'm a witness. I had to let my spirit rise up. I had to let my spirit rise up. I had to let my spirit rise up and tell my brain, you will not explode. You will not explode. You will not explode. I want to be made whole. So he spoke to his, his spirit. I'm almost done. And I want to tell you something that blew my mind here. Y'all, y'all ready? This is a whole lot. I got, I'm, I'm going to be done. Oh, Lord, I'm going to be done. He was there 38 years. But he didn't realize that in him being there, promises in the gospel of John. <laughs> there are 11 promises in the gospel of John. The first one is a person can receive everlasting life by believing in the Son of God. The second is a person can have eternal life by spiritually believing God, Jesus' body. By following Jesus, you will not walk in darkness. Those who continue in Jesus' word will, be, will not walk in darkness. Those who continue in Jesus' word will be set free. A person will truly be made free by Jesus. God the Father will honor those who serve Christ. Those who believe in Jesus will do greater deeds than he did. Glory. Those who obey Christ's command will receive the Holy Spirit. Those who keep Jesus' command will be loved by him and will be loved by him and God the Father. Those who abide Jesus as friend, if he will obey, just told him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Scripture says immediately. Yeah, I'm working hard here. Y'all need any immediate blessing. It says immediately the man got up picked up his bed and walked because Jesus was the missing ingredient okay he started he he did something he hadn't been able to do in 38 years I'm gonna say this and then I'm gonna say that. um I love what Jesus I thank you there's some uh, just like those words are in the English language. There's some opposites to those words. The opposite of rise is to sit. The opposite of take up is to give up. And the opposite what? Take up your bed and what? Walk is to be still. Can I say that again? Is to be still. Can I say that again? The opposite of rise is to stay sit. So Jesus, whatever it is that you're thinking that you cannot do, I need you to understand that Jesus can do the opposite. And here's what got me. Because I want you to say this with me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The man was saying, I cannot, I should not, and I will not. That's why he was at the pool. He was saying, I cannot. Okay, I cannot, I should not, and I will not. Let me help you. Jesus to do. I'm going to say it again. The things that Jesus told him to do were in exact conflict with what he had told himself he could not do. He could not rise, he should not take up his bed, and he could not walk. Cannot rise, I cannot take up my bed, because the law at the time said you could not be healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus had walked through the sheep gate on a Sunday morning. Instead of being at church, he decided he'd go and heal somebody. And so the man had developed in his mind and a congress he had set up a president in his head that told him he could not do something he should not do it and he would not do it Jesus came and broke those chains and said I know you say you could not do it but I'm telling you get up 
I know you say you should not do it, but I'm telling you, take up your bed and walk. And we have established government spiritually in our head. Demonic governments. Demonic governments that speak against what the word of God is saying. And every time somebody comes and says to you, how you doing? And you say, well, if it ain't one thing, it's something else. That's a government. What you should be saying is, I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed when I lay down. I'm blessed when I get up. I'm blessed when I go in. I'm blessed when I go out. I don't care what it looks like. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I don't care what it looks like. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't care what it looks like. I'm the head and not the tail. Above only and not beneath. We came to destroy some demonic governments tonight. Hallelujah. We're going to vote them out of office. We're going to vote them out of office. And we're going to establish Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords as head of our life, head of our home, head of our mind, head of our work, head of our purpose, head of our promise in Jesus' name. Uh, it's time to break some government tonight. It's time to vote some spirits out of us. It's time to tell them you got to go. The regime has changed. Everything is different. There's a new president, and I'm getting ready to inaugurate Jesus in my life. Can I help you? It's how Elliot and I do it. We get up every morning, and we affect the fact that we can't do what we think we can't do. Come on, baby. We and our seed are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're covered in the blood of Jesus from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. No weapon formed against us shall prosper for we and our seed are the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when we lay down, blessed when we get up, blessed when we go in, blessed when we go out. Every day, every day, we got to evict some governments tonight. If you want train change and restoration, but transformation means there's got to be some eviction. Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? You want a new government in your mind? I'm tired of my head trying to tell me what I can't do. I had to evict a demonic government tonight. I had to make a decision that I was going to let the whole, and, and I promise you this is the Holy Ghost because I had nothing about government in my notes. The God I serve. And could it be the reason I don't have what I want has nothing to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with me. It has everything to do with me. And when he comes to me and asks me, do I want to be made whole? I'm telling him, well, you know, I work a job in Jesus. When I get home, I'm tired. I don't have time to study. And what's so amazing is that he loves us anyway. Because remember I said Monday night, all the days of my life are written in your book. Psalm 139, read it, before I even knew them. Now that's something to wrap your mind around because that means now that everything that you went through, every trauma, every drama, all of it, the Lord already knew it was written in the book. But I also said there comes a time when you get to a chapter. Because not only was that written, my chapter of changing government was written. And I said to you, I said Monday night, turn the page. I said last night, turn the page. 
And then I shared that, guess what? Because when you go back to look at it, the pages behind you are empty. The stuff that you're holding on to right now doesn't matter to Jesus. He didn't even ask the man how you got here. He already knew because the text says he knew his condition when he got there. He never said, so, sir, how did you get here? So why are we asking the saints of God when they walk through the door and they don't look like we look? So what's your story? How'd you get here? It doesn't matter. I'm going to break that chain. It does not matter. If you want it, if you want to be made well, then Jesus will tell you, rise, take up the very thing that you've been laying on all your life and walk with it. Use it to push you forward. Use it to step into purpose. Use it to step into promise. But Elder, you don't understand. I've been abused. I have too. Elder, you don't understand. I, I, I was raped. I was too. I told y'all if they play the tape of my life, you put me out to church. All I'm going to say is I enjoyed my sinful life. I was not looking for Jesus. But I praise God that one day he walked through a sheep gate when I was laying on a bed that I couldn't get out of. And he saw me and he walked over and asked me a question. Isn't it interesting? The man couldn't look for Jesus, but Jesus made an entrance and came looking for him. And he asked me a question. Gwen, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? And I gave him excuses. And I gave him excuses. I don't know if I can get over this. I've had family walk away. This hurts too much. I discovered I was a child of incest. This, I can't, I don't know if I can do this. And all he said was rise. Take up your bed. Take up the very thing that has held you down. Use it to deliver people. Use it to minister to people. Use it to talk to people. Use it to tell people about me. Use it for my glory. Use it for my glory. Use it for my glory. And walk. And I've been walking ever since. Come on, stand to your feet. I'm about, I'm done. I'm done. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I'm very serious about this. I'm very serious about the fact that we've got, we've got to get beyond these demonic governments that we have put in our head. What people said, what people close to us said, what mama and them said, what aunties and them said. Some of it, they didn't mean harm. Some of it, they did. We got to break down the government about you can't do that. Nobody in your family went to college. Why you think you can go to college? We got to break down you not smart enough. If I was you, I wouldn't apply for that job. You know, that's over your head. And all Jesus said is rise. He didn't even ask the man his name. I feel some kind of way. You don't even want to know my name. His name wasn't important. So for all of those out there online here who we trying to make a name for ourselves, please understand, it's his name. It's his name. It's his name. It's not my name. It's not your name. It's not even the church's name. It's his name. That we should be declaring and decreeing the name of Jesus. He's the one that can tell you, rise, take up your bed. And he's the missing ingredient. I got one last thing I got to say. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for bringing it back to my remembrance. I know I had an aunt. Y'all, everybody had an auntie. Everybody had an auntie that could cook. Man, I had an auntie that could throw down. Uh, my Aunt Helen, she made rolls and biscuits. And I grew up on a farm, y'all, so I didn't wake up in the morning to know 
hash browns that was folded up in a, in a little piece of paper. That's not how I was brought up. I woke up to full-fledged breakfast. I mean, seriously. And, 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 and she, could, she could cook. And her pies and her case Thanksgiving, we loved it. And I remember one Thanksgiving, my Aunt Helen and my husband had the privilege of meeting her. And actually, when she passed, my husband and I were the ones that found her. But she had made a cake, and she, I came downstairs. There was a kitchen downstairs and one upstairs. I came downstairs. Downstairs was her kitchen. And I came downstairs, and I saw the cake on the table, and I ran over to it because she let me be the taster, you know. And because all her cakes always had a slice out of them when she presented them because that was me. She did that for me. And so I got, I sliced the cake, and she said, she said, oh, no, 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 baby, you can't use that cake because I forgot to put in the ingredient. I said, what did you forget? She said, I forgot the sugar. He's sweet, I know. The main ingredient. He, he's sweet, I know. Storm clouds may rise. Strong winds may blow. Come on, Lily, I'm awesome. I'll tell the world where I go. I found a sailor, and he's sweet.
your purpose out when you get to heaven then you can shout oh I'll tell the world where I go or I found I found a That's what I keep hearing in my spirit. Somebody, rise, 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 rise. Come on, get up. Rise. Come on, get up. Rise. 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 Come on, get up. I need you to get up. Get up in your mind. If you'll allow me, the leading of the spirit, there's a prophetic word for this house. And I want to release the mic to Prophet Beverly Medley. And that's what I'm feeling in my spirit. She's been here every day. Y'all need to know I'm upset because she was a private prophet for a while. I keep telling people that. But I believe that she has a word for the house. She has a word for us to help us break these demonic governments that are keeping us from doing everything that God has intended for us to do. Please honor her gift. Y'all don't know the story, but she has given up everything for God. Mi ante le yoshi kera mansu, sura mana na na si kita le yoshi, isura baya. Sweet Jesus, ore mansi kita, sura mana si kara, shure kema. Iko rabansi. Man sikit di osai, hikai so raba. Man sukur man dia sikit tohulu. Yes, Jesus. Kita lihat dalam man su, hikai ya so raba dia. Yes, Lord. Mhm. Oh, Rabbi, 
og se ki dai mo she mai no ro she ba hai ikan no ro bo ne se ke tu ho she na ma ni se ke glory jesus u ba hai ya ma so i ko ra ma si ki le ba no so ko ra ka hai Yes, Lord. of your purpose is yet to be revealed. You know what your soul purpose is in this house. Elder called you prophet. She was correct. There's coming a time where your gift is going to have to be used in the house on a regular and God is establishing it to where it would be receptive among those who doubt who he's chosen and called you to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, Oya. Oya. He wants to pour. He wants to pour. I 
heard him say that this one other time, and I hear him saying, there's not a crushing to produce the oil for this next level of anointing, but there's a pouring. story 
there was a lady sitting back here. Is she gone? I have a word for her. What was her name? tell you to call her right now, but I'll get it when we're done because I got to give her this word. Mama Vancey, come here for a second.
figured out we don't walk in there when I came through the door this man greets me and he said you in for a blessing Lord knows he told the truth I've been talking about you talking about you is what happened anybody in here who felt for me anybody you know you think you ain't got a voice they say I got a mouth God gave it to me. This is who I am. He said every bit of it. But let me seven years ago on September the 11th my husband had a real bad accident. He um, was flying up Georgia for the day of the meeting on a Friday. September the 11th was on a Friday. He went to fly up the garden. I go help out at the school with the games and stuff. Never take my phone in there. Spirit told me to take my phone in private. I'm out there on the field cutting up like I do. My phone just kept going off. It was my husband that he trusted and ran over his head. He drove himself away from the hospital. They let me go back there with why did you fly? Because he goes to the doctor and stuff to find me. He said, I want to see you and do some stuff. That's what he called me. My husband lived seven days. I mean, he had a beautiful man. Forty-nine years. Forty-nine years. On September the 18th. Let me take care of his daughter. Sweet mama, here's what you will do. You will never do it again. The third thing you do, my child, we did not do it. You want to know how I was? A lot of things in the office. That was my, that was the divine thing. He used to say, and the truth was probably the last person to talk about God and prove to God. Even your son is in the office. 
Praise God, and I'm not going to prolong, but for you to stay here at this hour means you needed to see and to hear and to know that God does a work even after the word. He does his greatest ministry in the hearts of his people even after the word. I'd say to Elder Gwen Cohen, you again just set this place ablaze, but more so you taught out of the scriptures to bring it to life. And I want to say for you who sat here tonight, I need you to understand something that what happened in this house tonight is the way this ministry will flow. I'm 
encouraging you. When we talk about church is not the same, what does that mean to you? To sit in an atmosphere where the power and the Spirit of God is at work. Even as you've heard the testimony of this woman of God and this relationship between her husband, we go so many years taking those things for granted sometimes. But tonight, you're supposed to be arising at a place where now what is God doing different in you to change you, to restore you, and to transform your mind. Elder Gwen, thank you. To God be the glory. Thank you for saying yes. Yes to God the Father, yes to his Son and the Holy Ghost. An anointed, powerful time here in this city. So thank you for reminding me that even as pastors, so many people look as if we're here. But you just took us right down to where the rubber meets the road is what I'd say. Keeping it real. And so to all of you, we love you. But as you heard her say, when the shift comes, when the Holy Spirit moves, flow in it. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. And Ella Corn, we here know that once we receive the message and the word, Deacon Lee, if you will, I, I'm going to need somebody that got a little big backbone. I, I know Elder Elliot can carry this, but we want to show you how much we bless and thank God for your gift here tonight. Uh, Deacon Lee, if you will, first of all, let me say this. I am eternally grateful for how this is for the both of you as we share this gift unto you, Brother Elliot. Thank God for you. You are a quiet soul, but powerful. And I think I'm going to have to start sure that when I lay my head down tonight, I'll remember not only that you are a man of faith, a strong man of God, and but you prayed in my ear tonight. And I want to thank you for that. Men need that. Pastors need that. So I thank you for that. And certainly, Elder Gwen Cohen, on behalf of First Baptist, our executive ministry, um, as much weight that you poured in here tonight, we're going to put that weight back on you. So this basket is a token of our love. Um, let, let, her hold, let her look at it. Just when She said she got the voice back. Now, get your eyes on it. We know you can't eat it all. But this is just to say to you that we are grateful and we're thankful. And this is our gift unto you, the ministry. Look at that. Did y'all see that? Y'all about miss. She said, give it to him. That's change because where we come, we give it to her. But again, with God glory, thank you all for staying. Thank you for these three nights. Let me say this to you, Elder Gwen. Yes, turn to them. Let, let them y'all show your love and appreciates. I say thank you. Um, I'm going to stand and say this tonight. Again, your gift, your gifts are from heaven. And I just say I speak that to you that you have to continue to glorify God through your gifts. You're sitting in a place that's packaged with God's goodness, your humility, and you're willing to serve and, to, and you're willing to serve and to cover the woman of God simply lines you up for your next blessings. Keep using them. Keep using them. You've already decided to do that a long time ago. No strings attached. You know how many people have walked around wanting to pull on people because they can get something for themselves? That's not you. And I want to declare it to you tonight that God sees it. 
and he's going to not just pour out on you, he's going to send you out with that anointing. So I speak it. Thank you. Receive that. I, I know you got it. But I want to say to the rest of you, First Baptist, this is truly from my heart, leading lady, we love you dearly, but there has been a shift in this house. So we must continue on. Thank you again, Elder Gwen Cohen. To First Lady, if you will, come. Most of you watch what happened tonight. And I will tell you this much. Lena Lane has been telling me for about a week how God has been moving, but she says in some ways like this, I've been set up. <laughs> and, and then she will go a little further and speak about, you know, why they keep pulling on me? Well, you know what? Tonight it was established. Thank you all. I, I know it's a long night, but to allow the Spirit of God to be free. But tonight it was established. And for me as her husband, as a pastor to watch, I've said this to you all on our anniversary celebrations. The, when she goes in with God, she is deeply in. And to Prophet Beverly, what you're speaking, he's raising her up. And for some of you who have wondered, what did Prophetess Beverly say to Pastor Everett? She said, you're going to love her differently. Some of you all already know how much I love her, but I can't wait for God to show me how to flip and turn this kind of love. And, and some of y'all might get tired, but I'm telling you, what this is going to look like is going to be new for me. But I will say this, I am going to cover and protect my wife in a new way. <laughs> Prophetess Beverly said something about honor. And I can't tell any woman or any husband enough about honoring each other. But I'm going to honor her in a different way, a changed way. So I love you tonight, and you know that. But as you and I move further, you've said some things to me that have pushed me. But I want you to know tonight, I honor the God that's in you. I honor who he has blessed me with. But I can't wait to love you like he loves the church. There is something in you that keeps me calm because of how you love me in, through, and through. But I want you to know that tonight, before this family that stayed here at almost 10 o'clock, you're going to see God do things far greater than what we've ever seen. So thank you for loving me the way you do. And this journey has simply been amazing. But can you imagine that it's going to be trans? forming come on y'all stand tonight and just celebrate with us as we get ready to leave thank you for staying thank you for being still to know that he is God Elder Gwen I would ask you if you got any closing words I want to leave that to you but I'll tell you this if you say yes I want to let you know this this is what God dropped in me. Only if the time is right, but I already know that it is. We're going to have a spring revival. We've never done that. We've never done a spring revival. And do you all know who the speaker will be? As we pray and as we trust God, this is what he dropped in my spirit. You're going to be coming back to Waysboro in the spring of the year. And we release you again to do his great work. Amen. Here's a microphone. I'm going to leave closing remarks for you, and we all can leave in the spirit 
and in the grace. Thank you, Reverend Yvette Greer, for taking the trip to Waysboro on a Wednesday night. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what we're supposed to see in the church. Don't y'all know that? That we don't just come in for two praise songs, one fast, one slow, hear a quick word, and then go out the dough. I don't know. That's a wrap, I guess. I don't know. Y'all young folk know. But my point being is, is that this is what the early church was about. It was about change. It was about restoration. And it was about transformation. And everything that was decreed and declared in this house, you are under an open heaven. And it's decreed and declared over your house. It isn't just for, it is over your house. You have to decide whether or not you're going to respond to Jesus' question. Do you want to be made well? To the musician, thank you so much. You stayed right in there. You hung right in there with me. I love you with the love of the Lord. Amen. I appreciate I appreciate your gift. I do. The gift of flowing in the spirit and knowing exactly what is necessary and what is needed. That's a gift. To be able to discern what the spirit of the Lord is saying. And you're able to do that. And I thank God for you. I only have one thing to say to you tonight. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Amen. Faithful and in obedience. Okay. I just see when they stand something it's just Right.